This is a short video about the additivity theorem for um, Riemann integrable functions. So here's the additivity theorem. So if you've got a function whose domain is the closed interval from A to B uh, to the real numbers, and let's say you take a point C that's strictly between A and B, then F is Riemann integrable on that interval from A to B if and only if the restrictions of that function F to the interval A to C and the restriction of that function F to the interval from C to B are both Riemann integrable. And in this case, the integral of f from a to b should be equal to the sum of the two, say, smaller integrals. And in a picture, I think it should make sense what this is trying to say. Again, if we're familiar with, in some cases, like when my function is positive uh, over this domain from a to b, um, we can think about the value of the integral as being the area under that curve. I assume you've seen that in calculus one. And so what we're trying to say is the total green shaded region should be the yellow shaded region plus the blue shaded region. That's all we're trying to say. And again, in that way, it's a sort of some kind of additivity type of property that the Riemann integral um, should have. So what is the actual proof of this? Oh, by the way, too, what do I mean by the restriction of this function? So uh, the restriction of this function to AC would just be this part of the graph right here, and the restriction of this function from C to B would just be this part of the graph, that part of the red graph that I've shaded in green right there. So that's all I mean by, again, the restrictions to these smaller subintervals. Um, all right, so what's the proof of this look like? So again, it's an if and only if, that's this biconditional, and we're gonna start with uh, this direction here. So we're gonna assume that the restrictions on the smaller uh, intervals are Riemann integrable. And what we're gonna show is that F is actually Riemann integral, integrable on the whole interval from A to B. And so just to ease some fixed notation here, let's say F sub one is the restriction of F to AC. So in my picture, I'm saying, maybe I should get a different color, huh? How about orange? Let's say this part of the graph in orange is F1. And let's say that this part of the graph in orange is F2. That's the restriction of F from C to B. And what we get to suppose if we're going this direction, right, is that these restrictions, F1 and F2, are Riemann integrable. So in symbols, you'd say it this way. F1 is in RAC and F2 is in RCB. And what we'll do also to ease some notation, let's say that uh, this integral from A to C of F, let's just call that L1, right? That's the integral of F1. And uh, let's call L2 the integral of F2 from C to B. Okay, so by this assumption here, the fact that F1 and F2 are Riemann integrable, I can say something about that epsilon definition, about how a Riemann sum over any tag par partition of sufficiently small norm, uh, how the Riemann sum over that tag partition should relate to this value, L1, and similarly for L2. And so given epsilon, any arbitrary number epsilon that's positive, there should exist somebody named delta prime that's positive, such that if P1 dot is any tagged partition of AC that has sufficiently small norm, so that's less than this number whose maximum subinterval length is less than this number delta prime, then we should make sure, or we should be guaranteed that say the Riemann sum of F1 over that partition P1 uh, is within epsilon over three of this value L1, where again, L1 is the value of the integral there. And that's because, again, I'm assuming that F1 is Riemann integral with this function, so I could always find a delta small enough to make sure that this Riemann sum is within epsilon over three of L1. And I could say a similar type of thing about F2, because F2 is assumed to be Riemann integrable over AB. So there should exist some other number, we'll call it delta double prime, that's positive, such that if you took any tag partition, say P2, where P2 is a tag partition of CB, that has sufficiently small norm, then I should be guaranteed that the Riemann sum of F2 is within epsilon over three of L2. So those are my two assumptions. And again, that's just us putting into symbols these assumptions that F1 and F2 are Riemann integrable over the respective integrals. And now what we wanna to try to show is we wanna to try to show that right F from A to B is Riemann integrable. Okay, so what else do we know about a function that's Riemann integrable? Maybe recall, if you're Riemann integrable, if a function is, if you're a function that's Riemann integrable, say, uh, that implies that that function's bounded on the interval. So F1's Riemann integrable means that it's bounded on this interval from A to C. And similarly, F2 should be bounded on the interval from C to B. Well, F1 and F2, right, if you put them together, you get the whole function from A to B, that's F, so therefore F should be bounded on A to B. And so let's let M be some positive number that is a good upper bound for all the Y values of my function F. So for all the outputs of my function, let's say they never ever get any bigger than this number M for all X in this interval from A to B. 
Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose delta to be the minimum of delta prime, delta double prime, and this weird epsilon over 6m. You can bet correctly that this comes from working backwards and doing some algebra like we're used to do, like we're used to doing, say, if, if we're actually tasked with you know solving like an epsilon delta type of problem. Uh, but again, just for presentation, I'm not gonna go through that. You'll see why it's good later on. So let's let q dot be some tag partition of the whole interval from a to b that has uh, maximum subinterval length or more norm or mesh, whatever you want to call it, that's less than, essentially less than all three of these. So what we want to show, remember, is we want to show F's Riemann integral on A to B, and what I bet is the value of its integral is probably going to be L1 plus L2. So I want to show that this Riemann sum of my function over this tag partition is within epsilon of L1 plus L2, which again is the sum of the smaller integrals from A to C and from C to B. So there's two cases for how we'll try to show this. But anyway, that's our goal for what we're going to do. So the first case is that uh, C is a partition point of Q dot. In that case, just split Q dot into a partition Q dot 1, which is a partition of AC, and Q dot 2, which is a partition of C to B. And then what do we have then? Well, the Riemann sum of F over Q dot should be the sum of, and this is kind of goofy to say, the Riemann sum of F1 over Q1 dot, right? Like my function F1 is the same as F over the interval from A to C, therefore that should be the same for that piece of F. And then similarly plus what my function F does from C to B. Well, that would be this Riemann sum here, right? So F2 on this partition uh, Q dot 2. And so note then that if Q dot has a norm less than delta, so the whole partition from A to B has a norm less than delta, well that tells me that when I split it in these two little pieces, they should all have norm less than delta as well, which of course, by definition of delta up here, delta is smaller than, uh, or delta is the minimum of delta prime, delta double prime, and epsilon over 6m, therefore this piece of Q1 has a norm less than de delta prime, and this piece uh, of Q2 has a norm less than delta double prime. And so what can we say about the Riemann sum of f in this case? Well, what I could do is a little trick where I'm just going to apply the triangle inequality. So the Riemann sum of f is equal to the sum of these two, and that is me utilizing this inequality right here. So that's all I've done in that line. And in the next line, I think you probably see, I'm going to use the triangle inequality to group some things that go together very well. So because I assumed each of these was less than epsilon over 3, and so in that case, what do I get? I get that my Riemann sum of my function f over the partition from a to b uh, is within 2 epsilon over 3 of L1 plus L2. And that would mean we're done since epsilon is arbitrary. Now case 2 is the harder case. And so for case 2, what happens if c is not a partition point of this partition q dot? Okay, well in that case for convenience, let's talk about what q dot is, right? So q dot, it's some collection of subintervals, call them ik, and some ket tags, which are just points in each subinterval. And let's say that I've got m of these total. Now, what have we got then? If c is not a partition point, what I'm trying to say is that c is not uh, what we call xk or xk minus 1 for any k. So uh, in that case then, C should just strictly lie inside of one of these IKs. So C should strictly be between XK minus one and XK for some K. So in a picture here, I've got my interval from A to B. I'm saying I've got my partition and the partition points are in red. I'm assuming C is not one of them. Therefore, it must strictly lie between two of the red points is what my picture should say. Now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna split this picture in half again. I'm going to think of Q1 dot to be a tag partition of A to C. So I'm looking at this subinterval now. And here's how I'm gonna define it. I'm not gonna change anything at all about the subintervals that are in Q dot here, right? Or maybe I should highlight this. They're all the same subintervals up till I get to XK minus one. But for that last subinterval, I want, and maybe you see it in my picture, I want this to be the last subinterval and I wanna take C as the tag. And then similarly, I'm going to define Q2 dot, really just going the other way, where this says I'm not changing a thing about what's going on with Q dot as long as I'm past at K plus 1 or past it all the way up to M. But the first interval I'm going to take in the partition is this interval here from C to XK. And again, I want to take C as the tag. So I think I've got a picture here. I'm just splitting the partition Q dot again, really into two smaller partitions, one of which Q1 dot is from A to C, and Q2 dot is a partition of C to B. 
Now what I want to notice is what's going on with the Riemann sums of my function over each of these partitions. So what if I look at the difference? Think of this as like the Riemann sum of f over the whole thing from a to b. And I'm going to look at the difference between that with the Riemann sum of f over q1 dot and the Riemann sum of f over q2 dot. And remember f1, that's just what I'm calling f when I'm only looking at points from a to c. And remember that f2 is just what I'm calling my function when I'm only thinking about points from c to b. So if we wrote out what this is, this is the Riemann sum uh, for the whole interval, right? From i equals one to m of f of t should be an i here, xi minus xi minus one. And then now, if I think about this Riemann sum, that would be, uh, in my case, thinking about these ones here, uh, I would have f of ti times xi minus xi minus one, and that happens until I get to k minus one. So in other words, uh, this part here is me adding up all the f of the tag times the width of the subinterval. But then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add this last piece. So this would be f of the tag c times the width of that subinterval. And again, that is using this part of the partition right here. And then I wanna do the same kind of thing for f2, where what do I notice? I see that uh, this should be some big ream on sum. So I should take uh, the f of the first tag, so f of c times the width of that subinterval, which is xk minus c in that case plus, and it would just look like the Riemann sum for the rest of these. So the sum f of the tag times the width of each of those subintervals. Now what I wanna notice, I wanna kind of play around with some of those a little bit. Uh, this, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pull off the kth piece. So when I say that, I'm gonna split the sum into these three pieces here. I've got the sum up till I get to k minus one. I pull off the kth piece right there. So ftk xk minus one, maybe I could zoom in a little bit. And then plus, this is the terms that have an index k plus one all the way up to m. And now what I wanna do that for uh, is because I see that I'm subtracting some stuff. So maybe you see that here. Here's, I'm adding this sum right here, but here I'm gonna subtract that. So I see I'm gonna get some cancellation. And uh, similarly, I see that uh, I have all these indices k plus one up to n, I'm adding it there, but here I see I'm gonna subtract that. So I see I get some cancellations there. Next thing I wanna notice is, what happens with these? These look pretty similar. Well, if you simplify those, and remember this minus sign here, that's where this minus sign's coming from. I have minus f of c times c, if I distribute this through to each of these, and remember, take that minus sign with you. That's this, and then what else have I got? Now I'm going to distribute this minus sign through along with f of c, uh, and I would get this. And now let's just regroup those, I think is the next step I'm gonna do. I see that I've got an f of c uh, everywhere here, and I see some stuff cancels too, right? Uh, I see that minus f of c times c plus f of c times c goes away, and now I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull an f of c off of both of these with the, uh, the minus sign as well, I think. So I would have minus here, xk minus xk minus one. So remember, I need a minus where this is. Okay, so that, uh, I hope, I guess actually that would be a plus, sorry about that. And so uh, in that case, what have I got? F of tk, yeah, it should be a minus. There, minus. Okay, cool, so those are good now. And so in that case then, what I've got is all that's left when all that stuff cancels out, like I was trying to say, maybe I should do this, all that's left would be this piece in yellow and this piece in blue, again, with a minus sign. So here's this piece in yellow minus this piece in blue. So hopefully you buy that so far. And again, I, I think I fixed it down here. Again, this should be a minus. That's where this is coming from here. But what did I do? I took out this common term, right? I factored it out. And now what I wanna do is I wanna kind of recap. What did we just do? We just showed that, well, the difference in these, I guess the sum of these three Riemann sums here is really just equal to this at the end of the day. And so what I've got then, let's take absolute value of both sides. And then now what we'll do is we will think about, well, this, each of these is bounded by M, right? An absolute value, if you think about the triangle inequality, say. So all this would be less than two times M times, again, I probably should have absolute value of XK minus XK minus one. And uh, what do I know that the distance between here is? Well, I know that this is less than delta. And remember delta up here, delta was chosen so that, uh, where the hell is it? It is, delta is chosen so that it is less than all three of these. So in particular, it's less than epsilon over 6m as well. So why is that convenient for me? Well, because it tells me that I could put an epsilon over 6m here, which of course cancels out to epsilon over three. All right, so I've got three pieces I'm gonna play with. I'll remind you of them. 
So what have I got? I can say, now I can tell you about how close is the Riemann sum of f over the whole partition from a to b, how close is it to the sum of the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b? How close is it? And so putting it all together here, what I've done is again, the simple add and subtract trick. I've just added and subtracted that, and now I'm gonna split this up conveniently here. I'm gonna split it up using the triangle inequality. I'm gonna put these together, and that's this one right here. And this is what we just got done showing is less than epsilon over three. But now the other piece, I'm gonna put this with this minus L1, that's this. And remember, I know that that is already less than epsilon over three. And then similarly here, I'm gonna put this one with minus L2, and that's this right here. And I remember, no, that's above, was assumed to be less than epsilon over three. So again, this is assuming that Q1 dot and Q2 dot have that norm that's also smaller than that delta. And I can assume this uh, because F1 and F2 were assumed to be Riemann integrable over A to C and over uh, C to B as well. So that at the end of the day, these are all less than epsilon over three plus epsilon over three plus epsilon over three, which of course means that's the Riemann sum of f over the whole partition from a to b uh, is within epsilon of L1 plus L2, which is pretty cool. That was one direction. Next direction is not as difficult. So suppose that f is Riemann integrable from a to b. Let epsilon be a, big, uh, be a positive number. Not big, should be small probably. And so by the Cauchy criteria for Riemann integrable functions, where there should be some number that's positive, call it eta sub epsilon, such that if p dot prime and q dot prime are any tag partitions of the whole integral from a to b that have a norm less than that eta, then what can we say? I know that the Riemann sum of f over p dot prime should be within epsilon of the Riemann sum of f over q dot prime. So in other words, if this function is Riemann integrable, it shouldn't really matter as long as your partitions are, are uh, small enough in norm, the Riemann sum should be pretty darn close to each other. So let's let F1 again be the restriction of F to A to C, and let's let P1 dot and Q1 dot be tag partitions from A to C. And now we're kind of going to go the other way, where um, I want to try to show that F1 is Riemann integrable here. So let's suppose that P1 dot and Q1 dot, they both have uh, a norm that's smaller than this eta. So that uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take, these are both partitions from A to C. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna extend them to a partition to A to B. And so what have I got to do then? I've just got to tell you about, I'm just gonna add some things to this partition, some subintervals from C to B and some tags from C to B. And how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna make sure that I add the exact same subintervals and tags to, uh, from C to B, I'm gonna add the exact same ones to P1 dot as I do to Q1 dot. So the exact same subintervals and the exact same tags. And what else do I wanna have happen? I still wanna make sure that the norm of the resulting partitions, I'll call them P dot and Q dot, they both should still have a norm less than this eta. So what can we say then? Then let's look at the difference in the Riemann sum of F1 uh, over P dot one minus f1 over q dot one, that should be the exact same thing as the Riemann sum of f over all of AB minus the Riemann sum of f uh, over this partition of AB here. And so what I hope that you notice is that uh, I'm saying that if I think about, maybe I should write it this way, this thing, as long as I'm on AC, then that part of the sum is exactly this. And similarly, as long as I'm on C to B, then uh, this part of the sum is exactly that. And then the next thing that I said that we did is we took the exact same partition points from C to B. And so what that means is that the extra stuff that allowed me to go all the way over to B, they're gonna be the same. So those would cancel out when I do the subtraction. And that's why you don't see any of those over on this side. Hope that you can kind of follow that along with me. So also, since each one of these partitions has a norm smaller than eta, what do we see then? I see that, well, I had assumed that these were chosen. Anytime I have a norm smaller than eta here, I know that I can say that the value of the Riemann sums should be within epsilon of each other. Well, if this is equal to these for this partition of just AC, and if this side is less than epsilon when I look at the difference in absolute value, well then this side should also be less than epsilon when I look at the difference in absolute value. And so that is uh, pretty much the end of that proof. Again, by using the Cauchy criterion, that shows that F is Riemann integrable over AC. And of course, you could do a similar argument to show that F is Riemann integrable from C to B. And so now that we know that uh, the integral from A to B exists exactly when, if and only if, each of these individually exist, uh, what do we know? 
Well, earlier we showed that the Riemann sum of f uh, over q dot is within epsilon of the sum of these. And so what is this for? Uh, what am I trying to say? I know that this Riemann sum should be within epsilon of this, but I'm saying it's also within epsilon of this. I know that there can only be one such number that can be the Riemann sum. Therefore, this has to be the sum of these, which is this here. And so a little bit less confusingly, a little bit less hand wavy, what I've got then is again, the integral from a to b of f should be equal to the integral from a to c of f plus the integral from c to b of f. And that finishes the proof of the additivity theorem. Just the last thing, a couple definitions to help uh, smooth out some, some things with uh, the integral so far. How do I take the integral from b to a of f? It's just gonna be defined as minus the integral from a to b of f. And the last thing that we should be comfortable with is the integral from a to a of a function is just defined to be zero.